May it please the tribunal. In the early hours of the morning of the 9th of April, 1940, Nazi Germany invaded Norway and Denmark. It is my duty to present to the tribunal the prosecution's evidence upon those invasions, which has been prepared in collaboration with my American colleague, Major Heinle, with regard to these brutal wars of aggression, which were also wars in violation of international treaties, agreements, and assurances. With the court's permission, I would like first of all to deal with the treaties and agreements and assurances that were in fact violated by these two invasions of Norway and Denmark. The invasions were, of course, in the first instance, violations of the Hay Conventions and of the Kellogg-Briand Pact. My learned friend, Sir David Maxwell Fife, has already dealt with those matters uh, in the course of his presentation of the evidence. But in addition to these general treaties, there were specific agreements between Germany and Norway and Denmark. In the first instance, there was the Treaty of Arbitration and Conciliation between Germany and Denmark, which was signed at Berlin on the 2nd of June, 1926. Uh, the court will find uh, that treaty, TC 17, on the first page of British document book number three. And uh, to that uh, exhibit, it may be convenient to give the number GB 76. I'm only proposing to read the first article of that treaty, which is in these terms. The contracting parties undertake to submit to the procedure of arbitration or conciliation in conformity with the present treaty, all disputes of any nature whatsoever, which may arise between Germany and Denmark and which it has not been possible to settle within a reasonable period by diplomacy or to bring with the consent of both, both parties before the Permanent Court of International Justice. Disputes for the solution of which a special procedure has been laid down in other conventions in force between the contracting parties shall be settled in accordance with the provisions of such conventions. And then there follow, follows in the remaining articles uh, the establishment of the machinery for arbitration. I would next refer to the Treaty of Non-Aggression between Germany and Denmark, which was signed by the defendant Ribbentrop on the 31st of May, 1939, which, as the tribunal will recollect, was 10 weeks after the Nazi seizure of Czechoslovakia. The court will find that as exhibit TC24 in the document book, and it will now bear the exhibit number GB77. That, that follows the last treaty in the law. <coughs> With the court's permission, in view of the identity of the signatory of that treaty, to read the preamble and articles one and two. Uh, His Majesty, the King of Denmark <coughs> and Iceland and the Chancellor of the German Reich, being firmly resolved to maintain peace between Denmark and Germany in all circumstances, have agreed to confirm this resolve by means of a treaty and have appointed as their plenipotentiaries His Majesty the King of Denmark and Iceland beg your Lordship's pardon, and the Chancellor of the German Reich. And Article 1 reads as follows. The Kingdom of Denmark and the German Reich shall in no case resort to war or to any other use of force against, against the other. Should action of the kind referred to in paragraph one be taken by a third power against one of the contracting parties, the other contracting party shall not support such action in any way. And then Article 2 deals with the ratification of the treaty 
and the second paragraph states, the treaty shall come into force on the exchange of the instruments of ratification and shall remain in force for a period of 10 years from that date. And as the tribunal will observe, that is dated the 31st of May, 1939, and at the bottom of the page there appears the signature of the defendant Ribbentrop. <coughs> the tribunal will shortly see that less than a year after the signature of this treaty, the invasion of Denmark by the Nazi forces was to show the utter worthlessness of treaties to which the defendant Ribbentrop put his signature. With regard to Norway, the defendant Ribbentrop and the Nazi conspirators were party to a similar perfidy. In the first instance, I would refer to Exhibit TC30, which is the next document in the British Document Book 3, and will bear the exhibit number GB78. The tribunal will observe that that is an assurance given to Denmark, Norway, Belgium, and the Netherlands on the 20th, 28th of April, 1939. That, of course, was after the annexation of Czechoslovakia had shaken the confidence of the world. And this was presumably an attempt, uh, now submitted by the prosecution, to have been a dishonest attempt to try to reassure the Scandinavian states. Uh, that is in these terms. It is a speech by Hitler and states, I have given binding declarations to a large number of states. None of these states can complain that even a trace of a demand, contrary thereto, has ever been made to them by Germany. None of the Scandinavian statesmen, for example, can contend that a request has ever been put to them by the German government or by German public opinion, which was incompatible with the sovereignty and integrity of their state. I was pleased that a number of European states availed themselves of these declarations by the German government to express and emphasize their desire, too, for absolute neutrality. This applies to Holland, Belgium, Switzerland, Denmark, etc. A further assurance was given by the Nazi government on the 2nd of September, 1939, which, as the tribunal will recollect, was the day after the Nazi invasion of Poland. The court will observe in the next document, in the British document book three, the document exhibited TC31, which will be GB Exhibit 79. That is an aid memoir which was handed to the Norwegian foreign minister by the German minister in Oslo on the 2nd of September, 1939. Uh, it reads, the German Reich government is determined in view of the friendly relations which exist between Norway and Germany under no circumstances to prejudice the inviolability and integrity of Norway and to respect the territory of the Norwegian state. In making this declaration, the Reich government naturally expects on its side that Norway will observe an unimpeachable neutrality towards the Reich and will not tolerate any breaches of Norwegian neutrality by any third party which might occur. Should the attitude of the royal Norwegian government differ from this, so that any such breach of neutrality by a third party recurs, the Reich government would then obviously be compelled to safeguard the interests of the Reich in such a way as the resulting situation might dictate. There follows, finally, uh, a further 
German assurance to Norway, which appears as the next document in the book TC32, which will be exhibit GB80. That is a speech by Hitler on the 6th of October, 1939. And if the court will observe that paragraph two at the top of the page, the extract from the speech reads as follows. Germany has never had any conflict of interest or even points of controversy with the Northern states, neither has she any today. Sweden and Norway have both been offered non-aggression pacts by Germany and have both refused them solely because they do not feel themselves threatened in any way. Those are clear and positive assurances which Germany gave. The court will see that violation of those assurances is charged in paragraph 22 of appendix C of the indictment at uh, page 43. <coughs> the court will notice that there is a minor typographical error in the date of the first assurance, which is alleged in the indictment to have been given on the 3rd of September, 1939. The court will see from exhibit TC32, which is GB80, that the assurance was in fact given on the 2nd of September, 1939. I was referring to GB 79, GB 79. <coughs> now those treaties and assurances were the diplomatic background to the brutal Nazi aggression on Norway and Denmark. And uh, the evidence which the prosecution will now place before the court will, in my submission, establish beyond reasonable doubt that these assurances were simply given to lull suspicion and cause the intended victims of Nazi aggression to be unprepared to meet the Nazi attack. For we now know that as early as October 1939, these conspirators and their confederates were plotting the invasion of Norway. And the evidence will indicate that the most active conspirators in that plot were the defendants Raider and Rosenberg. The Norwegian invasion is in one respect not a typical Nazi aggression, in that Hitler had to be persuaded to embark upon it. The chief instruments of persuasion were Rader and Rosenberg. Rader because he thought Norway strategically important and because he coveted glory for his navy. Rosenberg because of his political connections in Norway which he sought to develop. As the tribunal will shortly see, in the Norwegian Vidkun Quisling, the defendant Rosenberg found the very model of the fifth column agent, the very personification of perfidy. The evidence as to the early stages of the Nazi conspiracy to invade Norway is found in a letter which the defendant Rader wrote on the 10th of January 1944 to Admiral Assmann, the official German naval historian. I put in this letter, which is uh, C66, and uh, which the court will find uh, further on in this book of documents. I should explain that this uh, uh, book of doc in, in this book of documents, the document
documents are inserted in the numerical order of the series to which they belong and not in the order of their submission to the court. And I'm trusting that that will be a more convenient form of, of uh, bundling them together uh, than to have set them down in the order of presentation. This is C66, Mark. That will be exhibit GB81. That is on law, then. C66. Uh, it's it's uh, headed memorandum for Admiral Assman for his own information, not to be used for publications. The court will uh, observe that the first page deals with Barbarossa. If the tribunal turns to the next page, headed uh, B, Visa Übung, the tribunal will find from documents which I shall shortly be submitting to the court that Visa Übung was the code name for the invasion of Norway and Denmark. I will omit the first sentence. The document, which as I have said, is a communication from the defendant Raider to Asman, reads as follows. During the weeks preceding the report on the 10th of October, 1939, I was in correspondence with Admiral Karls, who in a detailed letter to me first pointed out the importance of an occupation of the Norwegian coast by Germany. I passed this letter on to CSKL, which is the uh, chief of staff of the naval war staff, for their information, and prepared some notes based on this letter for my report to the Führer, which I made on the 10th of October, 1939. Since my opinion was identical with that of Admiral Karls, while at the same time SKL was more dubious about the matter. In these notes, I stressed the disadvantages which an occupation of Norway by the British would have for us control of the approaches to the Baltic outflanking of our naval operations and, and of our air attacks on Britain, pressure on Sweden. I also stressed the advantages for us of the occupation of the Norwegian coast, outlet to the North Atlantic, no possibility of a British mine barrier, as in the year 1917-1918. Naturally, at the time, only the coast and bases were considered. I included Narvik, though Admiral Karls, in the course of our correspondence, thought that Narvik could be excluded. The Führer saw at once the significance of the Norwegian problem. He asked me to leave the notes and stated that he wished to consider the question himself. I will pause in the reading of that document at that point and return to it later so that the story may be uh, revealed to the court in a chronological order. Uh, that report of Rader uh, in my submission shows that the whole evolution of this Nazi campaign against Norway affords a good example of the participation of the German high command in the Nazi conspiracy to attack inoffensive neighbors. This letter, which I have, an extract from which I have just read, 
uh, has revealed that Raider reported to Hitler on the 10th of October 1939. This, this report uh, is, was made in January 1944 by the defendant Raider to Assmann, who was the German naval historian, and so presumably was for the purposes of history. Uh, before this report of, the, of October 1939 was made to the Führer, Raider got a second opinion on the Norwegian invasion. On the 3rd of October, Raider made out a questionnaire uh, to, to which I now invite the court's attention. It is C122, and the court will find it next but one to C one six C sixty six in the document book. That'll now be G B eighty two. <coughs> that, uh, as the tribunal will observe, is headed gaining of bases in Norway. Extract from war diary and bears the date the 3rd of October, 1939. And it reads, the Chief of Naval War Staff, who was the defendant raider, considers it necessary that the Führer be informed as soon as possible of the opinions of the Naval War Staff on the possibilities of extending the operational base to the north. <coughs> It must be ascertained whether it is possible to gain bases in Norway under the combined pressure of Russia and Germany with the aim of improving our strategic and operational position. The following questions must be given consideration. A. What places in Norway can be considered as bases? B. Can bases be gained by military force against Norway's will? if it is impossible to carry this out without fighting. C. What are the possibilities of defense after the occupation? D. Will the harbors have to be developed completely as bases or have they already advantages suitable for supply position? <coughs> then there follows in parenthesis FOU boats, which is, which is a reference, of course, to the defendant Dönitz, already considers such harbors extremely useful as equipment and supply bases for Atlantic U-boats to call at temporarily. And then question E, what decisive advantages would exist for the conduct of the war at sea in gaining bases in North Denmark? For example, Skagen. There is, uh, in our possession, a document which bears the exhibit number C5, to find which it will be necessary for the court to go back in the document book. It's the first of these C exhibits, uh, which will be U UK exhibit eight, GB exhibit 83, which... Uh, is a memorandum written by the defendant Dönitz on Norwegian bases, and which presumably relates to the questionnaire of the defendant Raider, which, as I have indicated, was in circulation at about that time. That document is headed Flag Officer Submarines Operations Division. <coughs> and uh, is marked most secret. <coughs> Subject base in Norway. Then th there are set out suppositions, advantages and disadvantages. And then over the page, conclusions. And I'm proposing to read the last paragraph three. The following is therefore proposed. One, 
establishment of a base in Trondheim, including a possibility of supplying fuel, compressed air, oxygen provisions. B, repair opportunities for overhaul work after an encounter. C, good opportunities for accommodating U-boat crews. D, flak protection, light anti-aircraft armament, petrol and MS units. Secondly, establishment of the possibility of supplying fuel in Narvik as an alternative. That is a Dönitz memorandum. Now, as the tribunal saw in the report of Raider to Asman, in October 1939, Hitler was merely considering the Norwegian aggression and had not yet committed himself to it. Although, as the tribunal will see very shortly, Hitler was most susceptible to any suggestions of aggression of the territory of another country. The documents will show that the defendant, Raider, persevered in pressing his point of view with regard to Norway. And at this stage, he found a powerful ally in the defendant, Rosenberg. The Nazi employment of traitors and the stimulation of treachery as a political weapon are now unhappily proven historical facts. But should proof be required of that statement, it is found in the remarkable document uh, which I now invite the court to consider. I refer to exhibit 007 PS. which is after the C and D series in the document book. That'll be exhibit GB84. That is headed on page one, brief report on activities of the Foreign Affairs Bureau of the party. Außen politisches Amt der NSDAP from 1933 to 1943. When the Foreign Affairs Bureau, Außen politisches Amt, was established on the 1st of April 1933, the Führer directed that it should not be expanded to a large bureaucratic agency, but should rather develop its effectiveness through initiative and suggestions. Corresponding to the extraordinarily hostile attitude adopted by the Soviet government in Moscow, from the beginning, the newly... It's about uh, 12 pages from the end of the document. Perhaps I may be permitted to stop the second paragraph again. Corresponding to the extraordinarily hostile attitude adopted by the Soviet government in Moscow from the beginning, the newly established Bureau devoted particular attention to internal conditions in the Soviet Union as well as to the effects of world Bolshevism primarily in other European countries. It entered into contact with the most variegated groups inclining towards National Socialism and combating Bolshevism, focusing its main attention on nations and states bordering on the Soviet Union. On the one hand, those nations and states constituted an insulating ring, encircling the Bolshevist neighbor. 
On the other hand, they were the laterals of German living space and took up a flanking position towards the Western powers, especially Great Britain. In order to wield the desired influence by one means or another, and the court will shortly see the significance of that phrase, the Bureau was, com the Bureau was compelled to use the most varying methods, taking into consideration the completely different living conditions, the ties of blood, intellect, and history of the movements observed by the Bureau in those countries. In Scandinavia, an outspokenly pro-Anglo-Saxon attitude, based on economic considerations, had become progressively more dominant after the World War of 1914-1918. There, the Bureau put, up, put the entire emphasis on influencing general cultural relations with the Nordic peoples. For this purpose, it took the Nordic society in Lübeck under its protection. The Reich conventions of this society were attended by many outstanding personalities, especially from Finland. While there were no openings for purely political cooperation in Sweden and Denmark, an association based on greater Germanic ideology was founded in Norway. Very close relations were established with its founder, which led to further consequences. And if the court will turn to the end of the main part of the statement, which is four pages forward. In the, in the intervening pages, I may say there is an account of the activity of Rosenberg's Bureau in various parts of Europe and indeed of the world, uh, which I'm not proposing to call the tribunal's attention to at this stage. But if the tribunal will look at the last paragraph of the main body of the report, the last two sentences read, with the outbreak of war, the Bureau was entitled to consider its task as terminated. <coughs> the exploitation, I, I beg your lordship's pardon, it's page four of the report. I was reading from page one. It's the page which bears the signature of, of the defendant Rosenberg. With the, out that with the outbreak of war, it was entitled to consider its task as terminated. The exploitation of the many personal connections in many lands can be resumed under a different guise. And if the tribunal will turn to the annex to the document, which is in the next page, the tribunal will appreciate what exploitation of personal connections involved. <coughs> Annex 1 to the document is headed Annex 1 to a brief report on activities of the Foreign Affairs Bureau of the Nazi Party from 1933 to 1943. Headed the political preparation of the military occupation of Norway during the war years 1939-40. And it reads, as previously mentioned, of all political groupings in Scandinavia, only National Samling, led in Norway by the formina, former Minister of War and Major of the Reserve, Vidkun Quisling, deserved serious political attention. This was a fighting political group possessed by the idea of a greater Germanic community. Naturally, all ruling powers were hostile and attempted to prevent, by any means, its success among the population. The Bureau maintained close liaison with Quisling and attentively observed the attacks he conducted with tenacious energy on the middle class, which had been taken in tow by the English. From the beginning, it appeared probable that without revolutionary events, 
which would stir the population from their former attitude, no successful progress of national assembling was to be expected. During the winter 1938-1939, Quisling was privately visited by a member of the Bureau. When the political situation in Europe came to a head in 1939, Quisling made an appearance at the convention of the Nordic Society in Lübeck in June. He expounded his conception of the situation and his apprehensions concerning Norway. He emphatically drew attention to the geopolitical decisive importance of Norway in the Scandinavian area and to the advantages that would accrue to the power dominating the Norwegian coast in case of a conflict between the greater German Reich and Great Britain. Assuming that his statements would be of special interest to the Marshal of the Reich Göring, for aero-strategical reasons, Quisling was referred to State Secretary Körner by the Bureau. <coughs> the Staff Director of the Bureau handed the Chief of the Reich Chancellery a memorandum for transmission to the Führer. And in a later part of the document, which I shall read at a later stage of my presentation of the evidence, if I may, the Court will see how Quisling came into contact with Raider. And the prosecution submission with regard to this document is that it is another illustration of the close interweaving between the political and the military leadership of the Nazi state, of the close link between the professional soldiers and the professional thugs. The defendant Rosenberg, in uh, his report to uh, Admiral Assman, uh, admitted his collaboration with Rosenberg. And I will invite the court's attention once more to, uh, exhibit, to, to exhibit C66, which is uh, exhibit GB81. In the page headed Weser Übung, that's the page headed Weser Übung. The second paragraph of Raider's report reads as follows <coughs> In the further developments, I was supported by Commander, Sch by Commander Schreiber, Naval Attaché in Oslo, and the M Chief personally, in conjunction with the Rosenberg organization. Thus, we got in touch with Quisling and Hagelin, who came to Berlin in the beginning of December and were taken to the Führer by me with the approval of Reichsleiter Rosenberg. And I will later draw the attention of the tribunal to the developments in December. The details of the manner in which the defendant Raider did make contact personally with Quisling uh, are not very clear. But I would draw the court's attention to the document C65, which precedes. Can you read the end of that paragraph? Uh, with your lordship's permission, I'd like to revert to that yes. at a later stage in my unfolding of the evidence. The document exhibit C65. The details of a treacherous plot to overthrow the government of his own country uh, by the traitor Quisling in collaboration with the defendant Rosenberg will be uh, indicated to the court. A plan has been put forward 
which deals with the possibility of a coup and which provides for a number of selected Norwegians to be trained in Germany with all possible speed for such a purpose, being allotted their exact tasks and provided with experienced and die-hard national socialists who are practiced in such operations. These trained men should then proceed with all speed to Norway, where details would then require to be further discussed. Some important centers in Oslo would have to be taken over immediately. And at the same time, the German fleet, together with suitable contingents of the German army, would go into operation when summoned specially by the new Norwegian government in a specified bay at the approaches to Oslo. Quisling has no doubts that such a coup, having been carried out with instantaneous success, would immediately bring him the approval of those sections of the army with which he at present has connection. And thus it goes without saying that he has never discussed a political fight with them. As far as the king is concerned, he believes that he would respect it as an accomplished fact. How wrong Quisling was in that anticipation was shown, of course, by subsequent developments. The last sentence reads, Quisling gives figures of the number of German troops required which accord with German calculations. The tribunal may think that there are no words in the whole vocabulary of abuse sufficiently strong to describe that degree of treachery. Is that document dated? Uh, that document is not, uh, does not bear a date. Can we break off now? If your lordship please.